between you and lunch, and that is a difficult position to be in. But I'll try to make it a little bit entertaining, at least in terms of content. And the idea that I have, it's not, I'm not talking about one thing, I'm rather talking about, um, a, say, an outline or a landscape of different things that you can do using information theory. And it's relevant to biology, but it's also a little bit uh, outside of biology because we are looking at agents or robotic systems, systems that have a perception and have an action. So we are going to ask, what can information theory give us in the perception action loop? And I ask you to think of it as a generalized perception action loop. It could be an agent, could be a robot, could be a bacterium, could be a human. Okay? Right. So... Um, the thank you list is quite long because uh, I worked with very, a lot of very smart people over the years and um, different things have been done uh, with, with these people. So I, I'd like to mention just a few. Tali, of course, who have done, uh, uh, who basically inspired uh, me going to that field by his information bottleneck idea, which uh, turned out to be incredibly useful for various things. So it, it looked like a, like, a, like a screwdriver, but it turned out to be a whole uh, Swiss army knife, and um, uh, lots of other people that I'd like to mention, uh, apart from um, um, Nihat I, for example, uh, Alexander Kubin, and many of my PhD students, Sander van Dijk, Tom Anthony, and many others. And I'd also have to mention that this uh, project that I'm going to uh, um, present today was sponsored by the European Union and the Framework 7 Project Corvus. Okay, so first a question introduction. I'm not going to explain to you that uh, how information entropy are computed. You all know that. I want rather to give you an idea why are we interested in information theory per se. And so originally I came into the field by the question, why did cognition evolve in biology? Or actually more precisely, I was interested, why do sensors evolve in biology? Okay. How does an organism know that there is an interesting sensory channel to tap somewhere, say a bat, that discovers that it can use ears to see things? Why? How does it work? Let's find out. Um, basically, I have actually a three hours tutorial about sensor evolution, which is quite littered with absolutely fascinating examples of performance, sensoric performance in nature and how organisms do that. And I will condense that in essentially two minutes. Uh, essentially, one observation that you get is sensors are often highly optimized. So they are so highly optimized, it's really um, absolutely astounding. One example is, of course, the uh, famous moss that can detect a uh, few molecules. The legend says it's individual pheromone molecules of the female mate. I could not find a source for that. The best I could find was Dersenberry, who says it's two to three hundred molecules it can detect. Still very good. It's very, very good. High resolution. Uh, we can detect very few photons. Uh, humans can detect clusters of 10 to 20 photons if they have been in the dark room for a while. So, for example, if they are astronomers uh, um, or prisoners or whatever. Um, they can detect uh, small clusters of photons. Uh, there have been toads which have been shown to in the, uh, detect individual photons. So it's as good as it gets, or very, very close to it. The auditive sense is also very sensitive. So little children have an incredibly acute auditive sense. They operate at the thermal limit. So as, again, they use the full channel capacity of available information. Of course, that stops once you go to the disco, then it's over. Um, on the other hand, we know cognitive processing is expensive. It's quite expensive. So roughly, I mean, the biologists here will probably know it better, but uh, the fly is supposed to use up 20% of metabolic energy just for the eye. So they pay 20% tax um, just to maintain the eye, which is the main uh, computational uh, aspect of what the eye, uh, fly needs to do. Uh, the human also pays 20% basic tax and if you go to progressive, progressive levels, like in the UK, uh, say so you think hard, you listen to a difficult talk or something, and, uh, then it goes up to 40-50%. That is really expensive. So 40 watts is not much in total, but in the total uh, GDP of the human body metabolism it is. So the observation is sensors are operating at physical limits or close to them. 
Um, there is evolutionary pressure for high cognitive function, not necessarily all the way up. We know there are lots of knees. You can be uh, a sponge and sit on your, on your rock and you are happy. That's fine. But we also have other niches like the octopus, whose uh, closest relatives are muscles and snails, not exactly IQ masters. But this octopus itself has went, went into a niche where really high intelligence and very high adaptivity is useful. But what is it all good for? We have sensors, we have cognitive function. We need to close the cycle. Actions matter. So um, this is a statement from a former uh, German chancellor. Where we like to call it the German Bush. was roughly <laughs> as intelligent. And he said, entscheidend ist, was hinten rauskommt. In this tone. So it's important what comes out at the bottom side. Now, spoken by some guy that looks like a big baby, that has particular evidence. So, but he has a point. What you do with it is what matters. So, we can sharpen sensors, we can make sensors better, we can think harder, have a better predictive model, or we can boost actuators. And the question is, what's worth investing in? Let's find out. So actuators have a problem. In nature, a muscle, you must imagine, grows in, in uh, energy consumption by its volume, but in efficiency only by its in, uh, section, cross-section area. So if you have a big muscle, it gets less and less useful. Yeah, small muscles are the most effective ones, and big ones are least effective. So big animals get a problem. Elephant is probably as big as you can get without having a living part of your life in water. So Hippopotamus is also very big, it lives in water. Uh, many of the big dinosaurs are believed to have lived in water, some really big ones. No? You're a chair. Uh, they're really humongous dinosaurs, that's not They're purely interesting. OK, well, <laughs> I guess there, there will be an, uh, an advantage, for example, if the climate is very good or whatever, if they don't have to move fast or anything. The point is now, the interesting is the following. If you operate by improving your actuators, then the situation is following. Assume you are a, a deer. We have lots of deers here, and now there appears a bear. And the, it hasn't seen the bear, so it has to start running like crazy. It can stumble, it can fall, it has to be very fast, very accurate, and put its legs very accurately. Uh, and there has to be super fast accelerations, movements, and whatever. Now, of course, if it could smell the beer from a mile away, it could just you know, start walking away without endangering itself. So the risk and the energy it needs is much lower. In other words, if you have better information, if you have better sensory input, you can avoid risk, you can save energy. Yeah? So you can avoid, for example, being beaten up by hooligans. We had this discussion earlier. How do you prevent beating, being beaten up by hooligans? You can prevent that by actually seeing, oh, there's this group there, and you just change to the other side of the road before they have locked in on you, right? Once they have locked in on you, you have a problem, right? And then we discussed that perhaps you need a gun, or I don't know what, what you need. Anyway, so the point is that sensors are useful, and they can. Although they are very expensive, we agreed on that, they are still less expensive than the cost you may incur once you need actuators to compensate or the risk you are taking. So, Basically, the big question is, um, how do you link sensory processing and actuators? And I am here actually preaching a little bit to the choir, but I nevertheless do that a bit, uh, because the idea is, how do you model that in a generic way? Uh, because the problem is, you probably all agree that information theory is important, not everybody does. So I'm giving you a little bit of a story that I like to tell to people who believe that all kinds of machine learning algorithms uh, can be used. I mean, of course, yes, but I'd, I'd like to make clear why I think information theory is something we can actually sell to other people that don't usually do it. So the idea is the following. In physics, you know you have dynamical equations. You know them more or less, essentially. And they are, in principle, known. Sometimes you can't compute them. In very big systems, it's difficult. But essentially, you assume the physics is known. The problem with biology is, it seems there's no you established unique model. It's complex and difficult to entangle. And you can have two world experts on a particular part of the brain who will not agree what it's doing. Yeah, And I have seen that. I mean, there are two really smart people that really know what their, their stuff, and both say, no, 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 this is not doing this. It's doing something else. Now, the question is, how do we distinguish that? Right? It's not mathematics. Mathematics is either right 
or wrong if you can get the proof. And I add another one which comes from an area where I'm particularly active, namely robotic cognition. Um, when you build a robot that does something, you have many solutions that achieve this and they are completely incompatible. I'll take a very plastic example which we are doing. For example, RoboCup is robotic football, which is good fun for the students. Very, very difficult. Uh, it, it, it looks like you know, easy going, but it's extremely difficult. It's extremely hard coding. And you have two teams that have the same performance more or less. They run to the ball, they kick the ball into the goal. Sounds like they're doing the same thing, but if you look at their code, it's completely incompatible. This is not modular, you can't exchange it. There is no way you can match them up. If you want to match them up, you have to rewrite them from scratch. And that tells us something about the problem of biological cognition. You can have the octopus brain, who has something like a cerebellum. The human has something like a, cere has a cerebellum. But they have evolved completely independently. They're not compatible. Yeah? And we have a, a birds can solve, uh, can handle tools. They don't have an air cortex. Right? So somehow the hardware is completely different. The software, whatever we may call it, the, the linking, is completely different, but the solutions are similar. This is really a problem. In robots, they're specific and hand designed. You solve every problem per se. You have a smart programmer. It's not artificial intelligence. It's intelligent design. That's what you do in robots today. And this arbitrariness and treatment of cognition is something that disturbs me. And I try to make clear that the point is not to buy, build better learning algorithms. You can always get some very smart person getting the learning algorithm better. What I'm trying to convince people is that you know you want to understand what's the essence in cognition. And you would like to distinguish essential features of your cognitive task from incidental features. So what must look this way and what, well, could be another way. Yeah, can you write in C++ and Python, assuming Python were far fast, it's not, but assuming it was fast, could you write it this way or this way? Well, it doesn't matter, right? And we know in physics that observations may depend on their coordinate system. So the, depending on how you look at a, a phenomenon, you may see different things, although the phenomenon is the same. And the idea is a little bit, uh, this is very analog, an analogy. It's not, don't take it at face value. It, it, take it as an analogy, as an inspiration, that in cognition, computation may depend on architecture. So I compute the same thing, but my architecture is completely different. Yeah, I have this mobile phone here, which is definitely different from an iPhone. Don't laugh at me, please. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's but still, I can do phone calls with that. I can do phone calls with that as I can do with the iPhone. That, that functionality is exactly the same. So essentially, it's the same concept, but with a different architecture. So if you like, you can see the architecture of a computation as a coordinate system through which you see the computation. It's kind of an analogy. And how do we do that? Well, by now you have guessed it. Well, this workshop is about information theory. Yes, this is our hammer, and everything that we are going to beat upon in the next slides is going to look like a nail. So we will transform everything to the language of information theory. Right, of course, Landauer's principle is the most fundamental one. I like to put that here down because you, people will always mention it. I want to make the distinction between what we're doing in the next slides and Landauer's principle. Landauer's principle essentially says that if you're operating at very low energy levels, you have individual molecules operate very close to the, to the limits of physics or physics. Physics is essentially, you still see the, the reversibility of physics. You cannot separate the world from the memory. World and memory are essentially intertwined. And if I erase a bit in the memory, then this bit has to flow into the world and heats it up. So essentially, if I pretend they're separate, yes, then the world heats up and the memory, I have erased the best. So, a bit, so here I had a one uh, bit of uncertainty, so it was 0, 1, and here it's guaranteed 0. So this uncertainty went into W, and that is expressed as heat. This is a consequence of the reversibility of, um, the, the micro, of micro, micro reversibility. But this is not where I am. When I go many, many levels up into the cognitive layer, we don't worry about that anymore. We have dissipation, we have processing, heat production. We don't worry about that. Still, laws hold. And this is where it gets interesting. So we move away from physics. We are really many levels above it. 
And there is no micro-reversibility we can't worry about anymore. There is no guarantee for that anymore. Um, but we still have things, and uh, one of the first people actually to think about that was very early. He was an early cybernetician, Ashby. Uh, and he basically has a statement, only variety, variety can destroy variety. So you need variety in your action potential to destroy variability in the environment, to suck out entropy. I will come to a, a more concrete example very soon, but I first want to uh, mention the extension by Touchette and Lloyd. And basically, it works like that. So this is a Bayesian network that's, um, well, I'll explain what, what it is. A Bayesian network, essentially, is a way of writing joint probability distributions. So the WA um, are all uh, probabilities of uh, W is the world at time t minus 3, t minus 2, t minus 1, t, and so on. A is the action at time t minus 3, t minus, t minus 2, t minus, t minus 1, t, and so on. And basically what we are saying here, this is an open loop system, and we look at these two errors, I mean the condition probability of this variable given this and this has a certain probability. So there's a certain probability of this having a certain value if the previous world state was this and the previous uh, action was that. That's all it says, this is our physics. Actually it's a bit more, we'll see that it has an important role. It looks quite trivial, but it has interesting consequences. But for now, all we are interested in, we have a world and we have an agent. That agent is completely independent from the world in ter terms of decision making. So the action of the agent is essentially randomized, the randomized policy. So it has a probability distribution of the actions, and we assume they are all the same for uh, simplicity. Then the question is, if I have a world and there is some and this is all time homogeneous, so uh, the errors are all the same, essentially, these conditional errors. If I want to reduce entropy in the world by a certain amount, delta H, I can ask what's the largest amount of entropy I can squeeze out of the world. And I can pick the actions that, does, that do that. When I do that, I get an optimal value, which is delta H star open. Open means no access to world information. I close the loop now. Now I allow the agent to actually look at the world at its state and take its policy or its interaction depending on what the state of the world is. If I do that, I can get better. That's delta H closed, but no more than the amount that I took in. Note, this is not equality. This is small or equal. It could be less. I may actually not be able to use it at all. So this information is not necessarily additive, it may be sub-additive, okay? This is essentially a very small theorem, but it's a bit like an information, not conservation theorem, but a little bit like a Carnot principle, Carnot diagram for information and decision-making. Is, is there some kind of uh, underlying equilibrium here, some stationarity? So the Carnot cycle is, you know... You can do it with stationarity, you can do it without stationarity. The stationarity is, makes life easier, but it's not essential. You, you, uh, it's a, basically, you t he just proves it for one triangle. So basically, you do it for every triangle for separate. You don't need, I don't think you need stationarity for that. So no, no, I don't think the stationarity is essential. It's a one-step entropy reduction. Yeah, just took a, take one, in, one triangle. I took several because we need them later on. Does it help? Is the system... Is the entropy, the entropy is somehow Markovian so that the action you take now doesn't change the calculation of the optimal entropy reducing action the next time? We so only look at one step. step. So we have a probability here. We can choose a probability here and look at the probability here. So basically we only look at one triangle. Forget the rest. But the next triangle intersects the previous triangle and so... Yes, but that is a different... Po you, uh, yeah, we, we, no, we, we don't look at a global policy, sorry. No. You don't need stationarity. If you do it adiabatically, then that's assuming that there's a steady state something or other, and that's a stationary yeah. assumption, right? I mean, it's, yeah, but... It's a, it's a strong assumption which I think you need. I don't think you can do it otherwise. No, I don't, I don't really know, so that's why I asked. No, I think uh, their assumption actually looks at one triangle. Yeah, so... Okay, but to go from... Sure, but to go from one to... It's not, it's, I don't think it's difficult. Stationary or what, you know, just for me, you say stationary or what, what do you... you basically, you basically, mean, if my robot is going to do one task one time, and I'm going to try to do that in the best possible way, that's one thing. If it's going to do it over and over again, like it has to get fed every day, or it has to, you know... 
Stationarity has a problem. Status, status by the committee today, but don't make them so mad that, that tomorrow you can't do it, right? You have an effect on the future. And if you analyze what the, the, the conditional interactions for one of these little triangles, and you're not doing it in a way that's consistent with the stationary behavior of the whole system, then you can't generalize to the sequence. So you're not talking about uh, finite horizon versus infinite horizon versus the be a finite program. program. Stationarity, stationarity is, is a problem, I'll tell you why. Because you could, for example, have a, have a, say, a system which is not stationary, but the example that I'm showing is not stationary. We still have this equation. Uh, you can still derive an equation of that kind. Stationarity, for example, would mean that you introduce noise here all the time, and you have this guy has to basically set it up. Yeah, you have your children that always um, upset your um, uh, kid's room, and then you have to fix it, and the next day it's like that. But assume you set up every day, you sort out a little bit more, at the end this has no variation left. So stationarity is, I think, a far too strong requirement if you're really interested in really the interesting systems. Yeah, so stationarity makes your life much easier, and I think it may make this even sharper. So it will not, I think it, it may create an equality if you have stationarity. I don't know. I didn't do that calculation. So stationarity limits actually the type of policies you are getting. So this is an example, and you will see soon why it's not stationary, because it has a strong transient phase. Right? This consists of a transient and a stationary phase. So this is our scenario. We have an agent. It sits somewhere on this grid. This grid essentially is infinite, but uh, we started essentially on the tr um, square of the size 11 times 11. Random. So it doesn't know where it starts, but what the agent does, it has four sensors um, around it. It's not actually four sensors. One sensor which indicates which is the direction of the highest gradient of this chemical. This is some kind of chemical gradient. So essentially we are going to do the chemotaxis, very trivial example. Um, we are measuring the chemical intensity, intensity in every direction and go into the direction where it's highest. Very, very simple scenario, very boring. So what the agent does, it starts uh, in this uh, initial condition, moves in here, and it has no stopping condition in our case. It doesn't matter, but we, in our case we wanted to keep it active. So it can't stop here, and then go, goes out, goes back, goes out, goes back, and moves here. So we have a transient and a stationary phase. We have both here. Okay, so very boring task, but it gets interesting when we start analyzing what it's actually doing. And here this is a full perception action loop. I will actually not use it, but I want just to show you uh, that you can actually do also memory. So you have a world, you have a sensor. Our sensor is incomplete, so it's partially observable world. You don't know exactly where you are. Then you could have a memory where you store stuff. Then you take a decision, then you get a new effect, that like we had that already in the Ashby example, and then you repeat, 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 and this goes forever. Again, I'm not making the assumption that it's stationary, okay? Um, memory is not something we need right now, so I'm kicking it out, and just create a reactive agent. So observation, action, and I have a new effect. Very straightforward. Okay, so you can show a conservation law in this little example, um, the conservation law is as follows. It says, if you have initially your agent distributed on a certain area, 11 times 11 with 121 fields, so log 121 is roughly 7 bits, 7 bits of uncertainty about the initial position of the agent. You let the agent run for a long time, t goes to infinity, and you look at the sensor observation of the agent. So the, sense, the agent observes S0, S1, S2 over time. The information that this sequence of sensor observations has about the initial state of the agent approaches the entropy of the initial state. In other words, to squeeze out, because you go to the center, you squeeze out essentially all the entropy that was in the original world, in the original state, you squeeze it out. To be able to do that in this scenario, you actually have to take in all the information during your run. What makes it more interesting is, of course, that the agent has no memory. So the mutual information that you have is the initial state of the world, then the sequence of observations over the whole future, but it's not memorized in the agent. Where is the memory? Well, of course, in the state of the world. The agent has outsourced part of its computation or part of this information processing to the world. 
If I were to prevent that, I were to make sure that this sensory information does not reach this information that you collect over time, does not reach the initial, um, the, uh, the, the full information about the world's uncertainty, the agent will not be able to go to the center. So this is a theorem, essentially a conservation of information. It does not always work like that. I'll explain later why. But here we really have it. So uh, we could say in a kind of bit uh, cheeky way, there's no perpetuum mobile of third kind. Yeah, you cannot take decisions with child, with, without having, at a certain level, without having appropriate information. Yes? Yeah, did you make the, the previous slide just a second? Yes. Did you, hmm? did you make some sort of assumption about that sensor sequence? No, uh, except that it's for the example I showed you. The example that I showed you has a number of characteristics which make it work. I, right, that's all I need, thanks. Yeah, okay, okay. You, need, you need some assumptions. Now, so there's no perpetual model of third kind, so you need, you can't make decisions without having uh, the information, or at a certain quality level without having information, although, well, there may be no free lunch, but sometimes there is free beer, <laughs> and I'll show you later where. But I would like to, to summarize this little example, this introductory example, why information theory is actually interesting for making co cognitive decisions. And that is basically this view of an information balance sheet. You have information that you need to process, like in our case, the uncertainty about the initial position in the world, which you have to somehow squeeze out. But you could do different things. In our case, we got information through the sensors over time. It can be spread out over time. It can be spread out through the environment and other agents. For example, I can tell my student, remind me that uh, we have a meeting in two days. So I don't remember that, the student has to remember. So it's stored with the student. Or it can be spread out in different ways between sensors and memory. You can do interesting trade-offs. What is more expensive? Is it more expensive to look up something on Google, on your mobile, or is it better to mem memorize it? If it's language, it's probably better if you memorize the words. But if, you, if it's uh, some kind of obscure trivia fact, you probably can Google it. Okay, so this is a trade-off, what it's cheaper to do. And the point is, the invariance of purely entropic. It doesn't matter what the task it is, we are here only talking about squeezing out entropy we have not yet said which states are important. I'll come to that in a second. So, this next step is to refine towards specific tasks. And this is also a question that has been raised earlier, namely, can you, when is predictive information, can it select important from unimportant things? Well, predictive information ta talks about all information that's available, but sometimes you really don't care about the most of it, right? There's lots of information available on Facebook. Well, most of this is probably compressible, but still, there's, even compressible, there's lots of information on Facebook, but you're clearly not interested in all of it. I hope you aren't. A lot of it is entropy, not information. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes, that's what I meant. It's compressible in a way. So, essentially, the model we are using is essentially an extension or a generalization of the rate distortion model, to decision, to sequential decision making. Tali has talk, talked about that. I want to um, talk about a slightly different aspect of it. You will soon see what it is, uh, but it's essentially very closely related to what Tali has been talking. So this is our model. I kicked out of world. I basically stayed in world that I have been the same. I basically say, in principle, you can see the whole world. I don't want to have complications with sensors. Uh, it will be complicated enough as it is. So I have a state. In the world, I have a policy by which I decide an action. Policy can be randomized, then it has a new state, and so on and so on. And now we have the usual um, reinforcement learning value function. Value function of a state given policy, which is kept through time, is basically the uh, expectation value of all rewards over the future starting in the state. So I start in the state, follow the policy, collect my rewards. This is our nice little recursion function. Everybody knows that. So, what's the task? We want, in standard reinforcement learning, we want to find the best policy, pi star, which gives you the highest value, v star. This is a well-defined problem. Now, standard RL, standard reinforcement learning, does not consider decision costs. So, in other words, the fact that I have to actually so you have to tell me what's the best way to get to Calgary. Yes, you take left, you take right, you take this, you take this road, you take... Oh, my God, I can't remember that. Okay, take the Calgary shuttle. Much easier. Maybe more expensive, may take longer. 
but it's much easier. So complexity of decision making is not, not, not irrelevant, right? The best solution is not always the best solution because your brain also has a cost of remembering things. So um, if we assume that really information processing is expensive, I gave you examples for that it is expensive, then it makes sense to trade off information processing costs with how much you get for it. And therefore, we include the information cost and expand the whole task to an IMDP. So MDP is a Markovian decision process. IMDP is an informational Markovian decision process. And basically what you're saying, principle of information parsimony means you want to make your decision with the least amount of relevant information. I here forget everything about prediction or so on. You could do that. Um, but here, really, I'm only interested in the immediate information uh, sucked out from the state, current state I am, to make my current decision. This is uh, the simplest case, uh, because uh, we will study something very interesting here. And we want a fixed utility level. So, for example, I say I want the optimal utility, but for the cheapest cost in terms of processing, or I say, well, let's take a little bit less than optimal utility if I save a lot of information processing. Let's see what happens. So this is most of by Oscar Wilde, who is absolutely fantastic, has this absolutely brilliant statements that are still valid. It's a very sad thing that nowadays there's so little useless information. I think this is deep, deep. He would love the internet, I think. <laughs> anyway, so how do we compute it? And it turns out that um, many people have looked at the question, and the earliest I've been actually told was Stratonovich. He started looking at that, not in the context of sequential decision-making, but still decision-making. He saw that rate distortion can help in valuing information in view of a given utility function. So that was a very good insight. Anyway, so basically what you're doing is you minimize. You can do it also the other way around. doesn't matter. You minimize the what we call the relevant information. This is the information that the actuator needs to know where the sensor or the state of the world, given a particular average utility value, and you control that with a uh, Lagrangian. So let's just go for the extreme cases. If beta goes to infinity, it means this is really important. You really want the optimal value. And if you optimize optimal value, you may uh, consider optimizing also i. So it's like a lexicographic ordering. First you optimize that, amongst all optimal policies, you then optimize the informationally cheapest. That's for beta infinity. For beta goes to zero, it's exactly the opposite. It said, I want a blind agent. This should be zero. Essentially, you can always make it zero. But amongst all of them who have zero information, I want the best. I still want to optimize this. So that's op uh, inverse um, lexicographic optimization. And essentially, so it means I want the best op uh, open loop policy. Both are very well defined questions, and you can all get them with the same formalism. And when you do better finite, you get something in between. The one thing, if you do that, you have to be careful with is a slight trick, but it's not entirely trivial to do. Um, you have to make sure that when you minimize this, <laughs> then you, when you, um, when you do rate distortion, you do blah, blah, remoto. You get a policy. The problem with the policy is the policy is different than the policy you use to keep your utility function. So you have to recompute the utility function, redo that blah, blah, remoto, and so on and so on. The trick, this does not converge. So the trick is to do intertwine the blah, blah, remoto step and the value iteration step. That works. Yeah? We have no proof of conversion for that case. There's for the... For the case of fixed prior, you can actually do a convergence proof, but for this case, I, I don't think that I'm not aware of a convergence proof. Anyway, this is how, how you do it. So it's slightly tricky, technically. And what do you expect as a result? Well, if I want higher utility, you need more relevant information, and vice versa. Not, nothing surprising here. So let's take a little example. We have a Markovian decision process. Uh, PASS prime, what is that? That's the transition. Yeah, so I'm transiting from S to S prime under an action A. I have a certain probability of doing that. I have a reward for doing that, so I get a penalty, a penalty or reward for that. I have a grid world. Our grid world is this, and it has walls. This will be important, okay? These are actual walls. And I'm going to look at two goals, B and A. Uh, I have four actions, north, east, south, west. And every action produces 
a reward of minus one, so I get an electric shock for every step I'm taking until I get to the goal, when I'm at the goal, and I continue, basically it's an episodic task, but I pretend I'm continuing, and then you don't get any, any penalty, any reward. It's just zero, so basically you accumulate the distance, the Manhattan distance between where you started and the goal you are envisaging. We are going to uh, trade that off as really uh, basically boring. Let's have a look at A. First, here is A, this is the red line. So this is the best A can do if I start randomly in the square. I need 10.5 steps to reach A, the goal A. And here I see that the reward is negative, remember? So this best point is here. This is the maximum value I can reach is minus 10.5, exactly as it should be. And the relevant information I need, the, the, that is the information I need to know about the state to pick the optimal action, the minimum information is 0.2 bits per step. So how does it work? Essentially that idea is you have a problem, uh, everything in the square that does not touch the walls, you pick north and east randomly, 50%. Once you are at the north wall, you go right or east. Once you're at the east wall, you go north. That's your strategy. So that's the best solution for the very simple case. When we make the agent blind, we see the performance of the agent goes down. And here, we made the agent completely blind, it's completely open loop, it doesn't see anything about what it's doing, but it still performs quite well. Minus 14.5, it means that although it's completely blind, there's still a strategy that he can do. How does it work? Very simple. So imagine you have the agent that's completely drunk. The strategy is randomly north or east. And basically, it does a random walk, wobbles here. When it hits the wall, it shuffles along the wall into the goal. And that works well because the walls act as a funnel. So the walls help the agent getting to the goal. Let's look at B. Now it gets interesting. B is this very hard to see green curve. This is the best you can do again. The best you can do is finding the center. Turns out that the average distance to the center is only 5.5, which means this value is higher than that one. So it's, this is minus 5.5. Good. But look at the relevant information. Hour. It's almost 1.2 bits per step, and the reason for that is that it's essentially you need a GPS to find the goal. You need to really know, am I above or below the goal? Do I have to step, take a step up, step left, and so on? You really need to know that, know that to take that decision. That's why it's much more expensive. And it gets worse when you limit how much the agent can take in this information. I make better smaller and smaller and smaller. And when I'm at 0.2 bits, I'm already worse than the other case. And when I make the agent blind, it ends up there because it becomes a random walk. There's no way for the agent to find the goal than hitting it. When it hits it, okay, it's over. But yes, that's the problem. So in other words, in this case, the agent was blind. It wasn't a corner, on average it's longer, but the, the walls act as a funnel. Here, the agent basically has a bad time. And now, I'm going to up the game. So these were the conclusions that I just mentioned. Yeah, uh, just real quick again, stickler. So on the green curve, which I can barely see, that's... Yes, this is it. There's a finite point down below. Right? Yeah, yeah, that's finite. Right. It's fine. The world is finite, but it's essentially a diffusion problem. No, got it. Thanks. So, sorry, this is all with the, the best open loop policy you said earlier? For the... For the is the open loop only the one at zero? At zero. This so, is the open loop policy. So it's closed loop is... This is best best policy, this is open loop policy, and this is everything in between. Right, now I'm going to up the game. So uh, we look at the same grid world, forget B, I'm throwing B away, I don't need it anymore. I'm considering only A, the cost is as before, one, one uh, unit per step. And I'm going to do something nasty, really, really nasty. I feel this is like, like when, when, you, when you really torture your poor uh, artificial life agents. I take the world and permute the directions for each location, fixed. So when I create the world, every of these transition points has a different meaning of north, east, south, and west. It's fixed. I'm not changing that during the simulation. It's just done when the world is created. So I replace the transition matrix P and R by some P tilde and R tilde. And this is our computer. Basically, you. Just permute the actions. This is a permutation of the action, what the action is doing. And you can show that as a traditional MDP, this is completely equivalent. 
Yeah. Basically, I sent this paper in to a certain machine learning conference, and the response was, "Oh, this is trivial." Well, we'll see. We'll see. Well, it's, it's not difficult, but it's not trivial at all. So this one is absolutely equivalent. In other words, what you expect is, of course, that the optimal values of the original problem should be exactly the optimal values of the twisted problem. No surprises here. This should be happening. It's equivalent, right? You can recompute what your original uh, actions were, and that's how you recompute them. And if you look at the Q values, they're compatible. So essentially, it's the same problem. Boring. Yes? Can you do a, I, mean, I don't want to take your time, but can you do a 4 by a 2 by 2 and uh, there's this, I don't understand what the twister is so exactly. If I make does an action, if space, I take an action. Does it change the structure of the space that you're uh, walking on? Yes, it changed, not the space, only my labeling of my actions. So basically here, this is north, at this location, this is north, at this location, this is north. But there's a connectivity associated with those grid points. The grid is, is, uh, remains the same, all I change is the labeling of the actions. It's like taking your mobile and somebody says that if you are phoning your wife, the numbers are in this order, if you're phoning your girlfriend, the numbers are in a random other order, and so on, whatever. It's still, it's still a linked list, so it doesn't change the topology in the space. It does not change the topology in the space. Just, just randomize your compass. No, got it, got it. Yeah, the compass, the comp exactly, you have no compass anymore. You lost your compass. That's a very good example, yes. So what do we see? Well, this is our old friend, number A from before, and this is a copy of the last plot. So this best, minus 10.5, this is a randomized and so on. Let's look at the best case for the twisted world. In the twisted world, we look at this point, do a sanity check. What's the value? Minus 10.5. Great. Sanity check works. It's correct. It's a, it, at least, well, it's not correct, but it shows we get the same value for the optimal case as it should be. That's good. Because in standard reinforcement learning, they don't distinguish between the labels. Problem is, make a poor agent. First of all, one problem we can already start seeing here, our we use 1.2 bits per step, almost. So we can imagine what happens when we make the poor agent blind. It basically does a random walk. That's the best it can do. Right. What does it mean? Well, of course, it's clear why. The world in the original case has north and east do always this. They use the funnel structure. You use the structure of the world. You use the walls to help you find the goal. Here, what we have, north and east, assuming I were to run north and east as a fixed strategy, mean that, mean that, mean that, mean that, mean that. They can mean different things in different spots. You have no consistent parallel transport for the mathematicians, or you have no consistent compass direction. That's what you're paying for. So you're paying for the loss of structural information in the world by having to use more cognitive power. And now, what, what the point about that is, why that is interesting, that many people have argued for a long time that embodiment, the way your agent sits in the world, is important. But it was not really clear. It was a good argument. People agreed with that. But why is it important? And here we give an indication why it might be important. You see, an agent takes its actions with it. If I am an agent and I raise my leg here, or I raise it here, it's more or less the same thing, more or less. And I take my actions with it as a kind of symmetry, it's a kind of local symmetry of the agent, that it knows that certain actions always work more or less, with more or less the same effect. And that is embodiment. And if you can rely on that, it reduces your cognitive load. In other words, having the right body for your task make the ta makes the tasks really easier. That is exactly what the proponents of embodiment have been trying to say. And essential information theory tells us, yes, that may be actually true, which is cool. Means that we may be able to say, um, yes, if I do choose the right embodiment, I can actually have a smaller processor, a faster computing, more effect effective computing, solve my problems in a better way. Of course, the price is you have to choose, choose the structure properly. Evolution had a long time to do that. Okay. That's why you find, for example, these nice walkers. I don't have a movie of them, which walk down the walk down these uh, as slopes, uh, basically as a, without a, an engine and without a brain. So, um, how much time do I have? Could you go back two slides yeah. to the to the graph and one more slide? Yep. Yeah. 
So, and then the, the plot that you were comparing that to when you didn't twist the directions? Yes. Um, the, the B one. The B one was almost the same except that it started for, uh, further up. This was the corner. Okay, I was trying the to corner one. The, not the corner, the center one. This is the center one. No, this is the corner one. This is A. I was, I was missing the difference between the two plots. So. Yeah, they're very similar, but not identical. Uh, this one is slightly higher. Well, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, this color is really bad. I, I, may, I will, will choose blue next time. Um, so basically, these plots, the, this plot is very similar. In fact, when it goes down here, it's almost the same value. It's basically a uh, random walk. So how much time do I have? I think we started late. 10, 15 minutes. Hmm? We go about 10, 15 minutes. Okay, then I'll do a little bit of goal relevant information, and then I move to, to a power. So this is a nice other application of information theory to agent modeling. I choose it because I think it gives us some nice insights. So, <coughs> one thing that people do in reinforcement learning is you have a goal and you find it and so on. But actually in the real world it's not like that. What you have in the real world are families of goals. You made, now you want to eat, the next moment you want to drink, the th uh, third moment you want to go uh, and travel. So there are different goals and they happen in different situations. And you need to pre be prepared for multiple goals. And if that's now the case, then you can look again. This is our old perception action loop. But now the policy that you choose does not only depend on the sensor state or the state of the world, it also depends on the goal you pick. This is now a random variable. We assume it's fixed for the run. So you choose the goal and then you stick to it. That's what you do. Now, the goal relevant information, we will split it by state. So we say in this state, in a particular state, we ask how much information does the action need for, about the goal. This is important. Why is this important? Well, think of it. I need to go to London. Right? If I need to go to London, I have to do this, 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 and this. If I need to go to the hotel, I need to do other things, usually. That's what we are asking now. Why is it interesting? Because we can find out that this tells us something about how we organize actions. Ah, by the way, um, not, yeah, exactly. Now we are going to basically do the same trick as with the relevant information. We minimize how much goal relevant information we take in at a certain utility level. Um, in the hen henceforth, I will assume we always optimize, always optimal performance, just for simplicity. And so we get things like that. Um, this is a plot where you can look at how much goal information. Do I have in every decision I have in different states of the world? This is a world with walls. So this is a grid world. You see these blue blocks. These are walls, essentially. And the blue shading is telling you, essentially, how much goal information do I have about my actions. Here, very little. The reason for that is it's very likely that from this corner, and my goal is randomly distributed over the world, I'm not going to stay here. So very few cases, actually, but I'm going to stay in this area. Most cases, I'm anyway going in this direction. So very little goal of relevant information. Almost by default, I will start going away from the corner. That's almost default. You need more information when you're in this part, because then you don't know exactly what you're doing. But this is kind of just a warm-up plot. Um, now, skip that. That's a little bit too technical. Now, I'm going to ask not just how much goal relevant information we have, but actually which comes back the bottleneck idea. The bottleneck idea is cool because it not just tells you in the standard Shannon way, this is your code, pong, uncoded. I don't care what it means. The opposite happens here. We are saying which of this information we actually need. So we are going to look at context. This is just a formal, formal presentation. I'll show soon what it means. I have an action sequence, our history, if you like, and the world is completely um, completely deterministic, there's no noise, so action history in the initial state is all we need, or the current state is all we need. And we now look at the following. We look at the information, goal relevant information of the current action about the goal, given that we have had an action sequence before. Think, given a certain memory of what we did in the past. And that is extremely interesting. So, this is basically what do I need to get about my action, the next step that I did not already know before about the goal. Why is it interesting? Let's look at the following situation. I'm here. I need to go to London. The point is, what are 
my the things I need to do first. The, the goal, need to go to a line is a big, complicated goal, very, very complicated. What I need to know now is only to get this or this door. Go to the door. That's all I need to do. I cross the door, and only then I know I need to go out of the building. And then I get my stuff, and then only then I need to know more about the goal. So if I minimize the information I need about the goal when I have a past, it means I only keep that information of the next action. And then it gets interesting because you now can ask, how much new information do I take in? And then we get this plot. So let's have a look. Forget the axis. The axis is also nice, but more interesting are the doors. If I go through this door, until I get to the door, there's no new goal information. It doesn't change. When I pass the door, I go out of the building. Oh, what now? I have to cash in new information about my goal. What next? What's the next step I have to take before I take my decisions? So essentially, these dots tell you this is now where you make new decisions. In other words, these are sub-goals. These are points you have to get to before you make your next decision. Very cool. You get that without having to impose sub-goals on the system. They emerge from the dynamics of the world together with the cognitive trade-offs. Now, we can also, of course, look at discarded information. You can basically say, well, how much do we forget? And of course, we forget a lot in the doors. Because when we are in the door, the whole information, how we got to the door is completely irrelevant. It's over. This task is over. Next one. Right? So here we see that this is a new information. This is the discarded information. And also a bit uh, striking is that in the center of the room, there's also points of relatively high new information. In my center of the room, decide what, what next. So basically, it's a sub-goal where I want to get to uh, before I decide what to do next. The cool thing is, essentially, this is a predictor for a phenomenon that people actually observe, namely when you cross doors, you tend to forget stuff. And the reason there are, there are arguments, for the psychological arguments, but we argue the reason is actually that you discard information and sometimes you may discard too much, essentially. So you throw, throw away the, the kid with a bath, bath towel. So goal-relevant information is a way to create sub-goals without actually having to imposing, impose them. You have a very natural and simple cognitive argument why you would throw away, uh, why you would have sub-goals. So I'll skip this because although this is interesting, um, I want to get to empowerment at the, in the last, very last phase of my talk, which is another application which also shows that information theory can be very useful to model cognition and, and agent behavior. So one of the arguments uh, behind the whole thing was, in biology, you have a success criterion, which is survival. Okay? Now, the concept that we have, we pretend like there are tasks and rewards, but this is not really true. This is an abstraction that we use because that makes it easier to code machines. But in nature, the concept of task and reward are not very clear. Of course, eating is always good and drinking is always good. But apart from that, it's not really clear what to do. And the search, search space is massive. It's huge. If you ever evolve really complicated behaviors, you, you get humbled. I mean, unless you really know what you're doing and how to design your, your system, it's really tough, difficult. So basically, I always like to say pure Darwinism, or naive Darwinism, is saying feedback by death. They're like going, uh, having students studying, studying, studying. They don't get any feedback. Then they have a final exam. Fail. Good. Very informative. Good, good university, good selection rates. This is not really helpful. And because it's so sparse, the question is, how do we do better? Well, we know there are dense networks that guide living beings. So they keep you out of trouble. You get hungry before you die. You get thirsty before you die, and so on. The problem with many of them, they're specific to particular organisms. What may be dangerous to you may not be dangerous to somebody else. We eat chocolate, definitely no other mammal can handle chocolate so well as we do. Yeah, so we can poison under other animals. It's a, uh, I was always joking that we actually this advertisement for chocolate, humans made for chocolate, something like that. Um, so the, the question is, yeah, you have a case-to-case -case base for artificial agents. Every agent has its own needs. The question, can we generalize that without having to hand design it for every different scenario? And so people have started to think about that um, and the idea is that adaptation of feedback for your organism or your agent should be dense and rich. Dense means you get all the time feedback. All the time you get feedback, not just at the end of a phase. Rich means it should be informative. It's not just a yes, no, left, right, left, right, left. 
It's really a whole set of sensors or a whole set of features that tell you I'm doing well or I'm not doing well. And people suggested things like artificial curiosity. One of the proponents of that, one of the actually pioneers is uh, Jürgen Schmidhuber, Learning Progress, Kaplan Boudier, Alternate Principle by Luke Steels, uh, Safina Singh uh, suggested intrinsic reward, which is essentially evolution driven. Uh, probably the closest to what I'm discussing here is homeokinesis, but, or rather it's information theoretic version, predictive information, which was basically um, um, using uh, the uh, Thales and uh, Ilias uh, predictive information model to get, generate self, self motivated behavior. Um, also, there's a physical version of the principle, the causal entropic course, which is very similar to what we are doing by Mr. Gross and Freyer. And I'm going to talk about an ansatz which has. It's completely biologic. I'm not trying to make a physical connection at this point. I'm making a biological argument for using it. We say our answer is optimize the information fit into the sensory motor niche. You have a sensor that can capture certain information. You have an actuator that can do certain things. They have to fit. So if I have a sensor that is a light sensor, but my room is dark, no matter what I'm doing, everything remains dark. There's no point of having eyes, or I have to have ways of creating light. So some cave uh, fish don't have eyes, or some deep water fish generate their own light. So it has to fit the information niche. And the argument is that we, that an organism will maximize the potential to inject information to the environment via the actuators and to recapture it again later by its sensors. This is a, the answer we are go going to use. Or in the much nicer way said by Tobias Jung, being in control of your destiny is good. Doesn't mean you do anything with it, but being in control is good. And it's important to know it. That's why we use the word empowerment, which we actually stole from the social sciences, because they talk about empowerment if you know you, you change the world and you can do it, and you know that you can do it. It's very important. If you don't know, it doesn't count. Okay, so in an information theoretic or a more control theoretic way, you can consider it as an information theoretic version of combined controllability and observability. That's how you can read it if you like the more formal approach. Again, we have this perception action loop, um, our good friend. And again, I don't need a memory today. I just put the memory in for symmetry. Um, we have the re uh, reactive loop, but now I'm opening it. I'm taking away how the actions are selected, and I'm going to create I'm not a philosopher, I'm using this word, I know philosopher will kill me, but it doesn't matter. Free will actions. So completely free to choose, whatever I like. So, say I choose A randomly, some, some probability distribution, and this has influence on the world. Yeah, I'm starting here, has influence on the world. This influence moves on to the next state. Here again, I choose some action, and I'm allowed to couple this action with this, yeah? But I don't look at the world, I don't care, I pick some random action, great. Uh, again, it has influence on the world on the next state. And this has, again, I do something and now I observe. So, so I did one, two, three actions and I look what outcome it was. Right? So this is three step empowerment what I'm going to look at. I'm going to look at the information I can inject into the world and actually recapture. Let's have a look how that does. Looks. Formally, we basically look at the channel capacity between this action channel and the subsequent state. Just the action, uh, 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 the channel capacity, and that channel capacity, of course, will depend. Um, yeah, let's see. <laughs> will depend on the current state I am in. So that channel capacity will depend on the state. If I'm in a different state, I will have a different channel capacity. It's not what I'm doing; it's what I could do. Very important. Why do you get rid of the memory? Um, the memory model complicates things, and so we don't need it here. Here, basically, you can consider this as a memory, as a, as a that it's implicitly memorized, the map. It, it complicates it. I can believe that it complicates it, but it complicates life in a very useful way. And people who don't have, have their memories removed, you may call them free will agents, but um, you converted them from a Markov process to an independent IID process, and that's different. I, I should say. I should say that I'm just sketching the formalism. There are lots of aspects that I didn't say here. So these can be uh, distributed, co-distributed. So they're joint distribution of the actions. 
uh, you have have a model of the future behavior of the system. So implicitly, you have a memory, of course. Is the systems? Did you make the system unobservable in some way, or is it no. still observable? It's observable. In and why is this different? It's just a it's just a vector input, essentially, from yeah. state to state. Is it still input, input, input observation. Right, but I guess the formalism then is that it could just be a vector input and um, yeah. relabel your time steps if it's observable. It's yeah, but, but that's a different story. Yeah, but the point is not just it's observable, whether it's changeable. Even if it's completely observable, it doesn't mean that you can change much. You can be confined in a corner, and I can now wiggle around, but it has no effect. Well, I'm, no, there are two separate things. I guess I'm just, you, you've broken this into, and I'm now eating your time, and I'm sorry, I'm about 15 seconds. Uh, you've got these three red arrows. Yeah. That's a vector input to a system. That's the way I would parse it out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So what's the difference between that and just having a single step process? Um, we have causality. There could be something happening in between. There could be uh, the, the whole you're point. Not looking. In this case, we could treat it as a, say, a vectorial input. Yes. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, but but in principle, we want to keep the way path open to um, uh, causal interference. Okay. So essentially, it becomes you get basically a function that depends on the state. All right. I need a few more minutes to get get a couple of examples. Um, so you need a, you get a function, utility function, or a utility-like function, independent of the system. That's, let's just skip the, this. We have said this. Um, I would like to link it to a couple of things that everybody knows, so get a feeling. It's mobility in games. How many moves do you have available that will change your world? Doesn't mean you're doing that. Just means you have lots of moves available. Money, of course. You have more money, you can do more things. Affordance. There's a door, and I can turn the grip, or I can't turn the grip. Or I have to pull it, and it's hard to pull, or it's easy to pull. Graph centrality, transition graph centrality is very related to that. It's basically the antithesis to helplessness. Again, this is a psychological term, but again, I, I, this is not something I can talk now too much. Let me move on. I just, probably this motto is nice. Tactics is what you do when you have a plan, so that's what you, standard reinforcement learning, when you don't have a plan, uh, is strategy, so empowerment does strategy. So it is what you should do if you don't know what to do. Okay, so let me look at this little maze. So we have this maze here, we say that the Asian that can move around. Here we actually plot dark the centrality of the, of the maze. The centrality is the average distance essentially from the spot to all other spots in the maze. If that distance is small, it's central. If it's high, it's decentral. And dark means it's very central. So it means the average distance to every other spot. Imagine this is a police station. So you call the police somewhere in this maze. How long does it take to get there? And of course, you want to place it there where it takes the least time to do that on average. All right? Now we do empowerment. In empowerment, what are, what are we doing? We are having actions. Move up, uh, right, down, left. And we see how far can you get, or where can you get, how many uh, spots can you reach. Turns out this is one, two, five, and ten step empowerment. And they are quite similar in character, but let's look at the five step empowerment. You see that here this is the most empowered point. It's the one that gets the most, reaches the most spots in five steps. Here you don't reach many, and, and so on. And this math looks very similar. In fact, you can look at the uh, correlation. They are not perfectly identical, but this is empowerment. It's high when it's good, and this is the average distance. It's high when it's bad. You see they're pretty well anti-correlated. But empowerment is a local quantity. So this is an introductory example. Here's another example. Let's, let's skip uh, this one. Let's just look at the pushable box. Uh, so, sorry. Um, a box visible to the Asian. There's a box in the room, but this box takes away space. You can't move in this case. You see dark means you have lots of freedom to move. Close to the box, you can't move. When you're up the box, however, you can jump down. Then, therefore, on the box, you have a dark spot, which is high empowerment. On the other hand, if you have the same world, and the box is movable, and you see it, it's important that you see it, then here in the world, nothing interesting happens. You can just move yourself or several steps. You are close to the box, you've moved yourself and the box. It gives you extra empowerment. It's quite a lot. It's almost two bits. In other words, an agent understands going close to the box is cool because it can play with it. Um, yep. This is a, basically a pendulum example, so you can look at the pendulum essentially and swing it up. 
And basically, every state of the pendulum has an empowerment value. Essentially, how much can you influence the pendulum as you, as you change what you're doing? Turns out that when you just follow the empowerment gradient locally, so greedy empowerment maximization will swing the pendulum up. The cool thing about that is actually this plot here. This is a plot where the model, in empowerment, you need a forward model for that. This model needs to be learned. So that's a form of memory, if you like. Here, Tobias Jung essentially did this example with learning the model on the fly. He took a Gaussian process, started with an empty Gaussian process, essentially, and started, with, originally you have some, some random behavior, and then he collects uh, data, he gets a new model, again, optimizes empowerment locally, and essentially, without much learning, without what you have to do usually in reinforcement learning, he basically, almost straight on, gets into the balanced pole. Learning on the fly. So in other words, empowerment makes relatively educated guesses what may be good areas of your dynamics. Of course, a poll is a nice system. Therefore, we look actually at the much more complicated one. I mean, the acrobat. The acrobat is basically uh, driven by the hip, so you're hanging down. And you see that it's swinging up. And this is a quite difficult task. Usually in normal reinforcement, you stop here. If you want to actually balance it, you need LQR. But that is usually twist, turned on by, 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 uh, on purpose, actively. We didn't like that. So what we did, Tobias just added LQR as a possible action so the agent can pick it or not pick it. So it starts picking it when we are close to the top. Quite a difficult task. And this is a nice way of doing it without specifying too much. Um, this is a cool one. I have two more, two more cool examples that I'll show and then I'll wrap up. So this is, um, we've, we think computers help us playing, they help us working, but why should we waste our time playing? Why don't we let the computer play, right? So I had a, uh, one guy who said, Minecraft is the right thing, so Minecraft, you take blocks, you can destroy them, you can move them. Let's have a, a, a machine that builds Maximize empowerment playing Minecraft. Essentially, this is a Minecraft type uh, scenario. So we have the agent, which is blue, and here starts moving boxes, creates a staircase, starts digging in, does all kinds of stuff, uh, just to cre and create, uh, create a more complex and interesting world. Of course, this agent is uh, wasting our time because all it does is just enjoying it himself. Uh, we make him uh, do something harder, you know? It's a bit like with students. You put them into pressure and then suddenly things happen. Um, well, that's not what you're actually doing. Here's an example. We have a lava stream here. This lava stream is dangerous. If the agent touches it, it dies. Okay? But death is empowerment goes to zero. So the agent sees this in empowerment. And what does the agent do? It builds a bridge. So it can cross from one side to another. It increases its potential of traveling around. This is what the agent does on its own. We didn't tell it to do it. It's completely empowerment driven. And the empowerment has been... And this is really nasty. Nasty example here, we pour hot lava into the poor agent's world. And what the agent does, it builds a dam. Sometimes the agents behave like politicians and see it only too late, right? So they get to panic and start, start building staircases or islands or stuff like that. But sometimes also they go into caves. They start digging in and put a, put a, a, a cork into the cave. And then they build a big cave system so they can still move around. Yeah, so that, that protects them from the lava. We have seen these examples, and they're quite typical. It's not that they are uh, rare cases. Okay, and uh, this is a nice example that I'd like to show because it illustrates two principles. You know, Asimov's principles. And I, I use that, you know, it's uh, nice to say. A robot may not endure a human being, etc., etc. We haven't done that, okay? We haven't done that yet. It will come, it will come. Um, the standard saying of uh, uh, Asimov Snow is a robot must obey the orders given to it by human beings, except where the conflict with number one. Well, this we found it too complicated. We had just a very simple task, follow the human. So right now we say, follow the human just by an attractive field. This is explicitly given. In the future, we're going to do that by empowerment. And the third point is actually interesting. That's very typical for empowerment. A robot must protect its own existence if it's not conflicting with the other goals. And empowerment is a kind of survival measure. So it, you lose empowerment, that's bad for you. It means you lose options, you may be in danger, you may slip or something like that through so slippery situations. Unfortunately, we don't have a slippery situation, but we have 
simulated something similar. This is Neil, so this is on a real robot. And there's, it's very difficult to do all these things on real robots. And the difficult situation are these two boxes. These two boxes are something where the robot loses empowerment and could get stuck. Yeah, we have a model where the robot sees, oh, if it's in between the two boxes, it can't move so far. So it doesn't know that it can, could actually push the boxes. And it is attracted to Neil, but it will not go through the boxes. In other words, the attractor field does law number two, do what the human wants from you, namely come to me. And uh, the, the empowerment makes sure that it does not go through the, to the dangerous field. And you see here basically the, 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 the landscape of the empowerment system. Um, and uh, basically there are a couple of optimizations you need to do and smoothing and so on, but essentially it works. And so I wanted to show you this is not just an academic toy, but actually one could do a bit more with this. And with this I would like to conclude and thank you for your patience. Thank you. that I didn't get to finish, I would, if, but I put it in your terms, I would say that the brain is put together to solve certain kind of problems of the type that you're talking about, and you can say that maybe that what it does is some Bayesian updating, or if you prefer, you can say it's common filtering because those are connected, but the idea is that I think the, the pie, the strategy is already there, and it's implemented by a bunch of neurons that have been designed in a certain way and connected in a certain way, so they can do a good job on these problems. And, and that's why, in part of the talk I didn't get to, the way in which I try to describe what an individual neuron's function is, is precisely what you had. And look at the mutual information that it provides about its input to the, all of its outputs, and I do that subject to constraints on the energy that it uses. Not quite a, it's not quite, in, in that little local thing, a utility yet because you need the whole brain together to yes. do it.